Hello, John. Quick background here. My friend, boss, coworker, arch nemesis was sent an email from one of their trusted contacts that said, hello, important information for you. Please see the attachment. Password UJY55. Thanks and take care. What an ironic ending. He was, of course, later confirmed to have been compromised, Defender identified some kind of Trojan, and stopped my friendly coworker Boss Nemesis from destroying his computer. Attached is the file if you'd like to investigate. Thanks and take care. Lauren. In this video, we are going to take a look at that attached file. We're going to explore what compromised her boss's computer and get to know how this all happened. This is going to be a maldoc file or a malicious document. A malicious Microsoft Word document comes with Microsoft Office. And with that said, we are going to be exploring and taking apart some obfuscated scripting language code. Stuff that will naturally inherently run on Microsoft Windows as a target operating system with some scripting language stuff so that you can more easily read and understand the source code, and for me too, because I'm not super duper smart with all those compiled binaries and digging through disassembly and firing up in a debugger and all that elite hacker stuff. Hey, if you are interested in that, if you want to be doing some of that hardcore reverse engineering, please take a look at this video sponsor, Zero to Auto, and the training course and curriculum that comes from Offset Training Solutions. With that, I'll go ahead and roll the promo, and please go take a look at all the sweet stuff they have to offer. Zero to Auto offers in-depth and quality training on all things malware analysis and reverse engineering. You learn to cut through malware samples, understand the threat landscape, and automate your workflow. Within the training, you get access to 25 hours of video content covering cryptographic algorithms, initial malware stagers, malware evasion techniques, core malware functionality like for banking trojans, worms, web injects, and more. You dig into the exploitation process and learn what exactly is needed for professional threat intelligence. Included with the course is a 10% discount on an IDA Pro named license or an IDA Home license, a three-month premium plan to the N dot run sandbox and access to an exclusive discord server where you can collaborate with other students get support for training material and receive new malware challenges right now the course has over 1500 students registered and always have access to new malware to cut up and learn from of course the training comes with a final exam and a course certification with both the theoretical segment and a hands-on practical challenge where you reverse engineer custom malware and craft a report based off of your findings. The Zero to Auto training comes from some seriously big names in the industry, to include Vitaly Kremez, Daniel Bunce, and Jason Reeves. I'm sure you have seen them sharing incredible research and threat intel, and this is your opportunity to learn from some of the best. Check out the links in the description to jump into some Zero to Auto training right now, and get 20% off by using the code malware at checkout. If you're perhaps looking for something slightly less advanced, they're also in the process of remastering their original beginner malware analysis course, which pre-registration is now open. If you head to offset.net slash beginner, that O being a zero, you'll be able to register early for the course and grab an early bird discount. Huge thanks to Offset Training Solutions for sponsoring this video. Okay, so I am over here on my computer screen. I am inside of a Windows 10 virtual machine that has Microsoft Office installed so that I can go ahead and play with this maldoc file. Uh, I do have the network connection disabled. It is uh, physically removed from my virtual machine here, and I can go ahead and open up the info.zip file that was attached to this email. There is our tell 12010.2021.doc. We can go ahead and extract all of these into our desktop. We'll go and extract that there and oop there we go defender immediately found something uh microsoft defender is jumping into action here and they say oops we found a threat we see the trojan dropper for iced id and we can go ahead and uh quarantine that remove it or allow it on the device i am going to go ahead and allow it on the device so i can do some more further digging so we'll go ahead and select that and start actions and now let me go ahead and move that away uh, i do have this document here now ready for us and you know we'll go ahead and pull the trigger let's open this thing up in my Microsoft Word. And ooh, take a look here. This is kind of the classic usual phishing scheme or some social engineering trick. It says, hey, this document was created in previous versions of Microsoft Word. To view or edit this document, please click enable editing or and then click enable content. Now note, these are the things that will actually trigger and detonate malwares that have been included in a Microsoft Word document. So that is not really recommended as you're doing your own analysis. Obviously, that is what will 
start the problem and let the malware run free. Uh, we will not go ahead and click enable content, but we will go ahead and explore what is actually in this macro. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into the view tab and you can see macros is accessible right over on the top right. We'll go ahead and view macros and you'll note there is a macro included here called auto open. Now we'll wanna go ahead and edit this and see what is actually present here. I don't know if you can see this text here. I'll see if I can uh, make this a little bit bigger. Okay, now hopefully that's a little bit easier to read. And note we have a public subroutine called auto open. Auto open is going to be what exactly runs and executes as this document is opened and enable content, enable editing is clicked. So we have this structure for a function here. We have uh, a little bit of data that we could end up kind of cleaning or indenting to make this a little bit easier to read, but this is the block of our subroutine. We define a variable YouTube pow set to string reverse of this document dot text, pass in the argument keywords. Following that, we end up using a with little context manager. With the active document, let's go ahead and save as. Given a file name set to YouTube pow, the value returned from setting this variable above specifying a for file format set to two. Meh, we don't really exactly need to care about what that might be. I'm gonna assume maybe plain text or ASCII. And then once we're done with that with block, we specify this document dot S with an empty string and YouTube pow passed in as arguments to presumably another subroutine. So first of all, we need to figure out what is happening at the very, very first line. We have YouTube pow being defined to the reverse string of this document dot text one of keywords. Now, the question is, what is text one? Uh, and you might be able to click around a little bit more in exploring what the macros will show you in the Microsoft Visual Basic for Applications Editor. You can see references to normal, here's our main module, and the Microsoft Word objects just up top here will include the this document settings. Now, if I double click on this, you'll notice, ooh, it changes what's available in our editor. If we clean this up just a little bit so we can make some sense of it, we do have some functions that are defined. And you might notice there is our text one function. We'll start here and we'll get to explore a little bit. It takes in an argument door like like. Okay, weird random variable name. And then text one is going to be set as a value. Now note, this is the same exact name and value of the, of the function name itself, right? That is actually how Visual Basic Script or VBA and these Visual Basic applications will return a value from a function. So the value set to text one as the same name as this function is exactly what this function will give back out to the main string reverse call here. Now it's taking in this keyword string as the argument to text one. So that means that we're going to end up taking the active document built in document properties door like like as the argument passed in as keywords. We retrieve the value from that and that's what this function will return. But then we run contents. Now contents, as you'll note above, is another function. Function contents, what it does, it takes the active document content and then finds and executes a find text x8 and replacing it with nothing, an empty string here. Replace is equal to two. Maybe that's just referring to plain text. Once again, we can kind of hit the I believe button there. And then remember, after contents is ran, after we save this document that returned here, uh, given the active document that is pulled from in that contents function, we end up calling the this document dot s function. That takes in the arguments of an empty string and YouTube pow, which is returned as the reverse of our keywords. And that ultimately runs something different. It takes in arguments like, like load and Carol next love, and then it creates an object. This is gonna end up being, hey, some quick little uh, Windows internals object. And I, I might be saying the right words there, the wrong words there, and that, hey, it's an active X object or some of the things that allow you to dig into other capabilities and functionality of, of Windows and a lot of those scripting languages. We run text one based off of, oh, retrieving our properties. Category is the name here. And then from that object that's created based off of the category property, we'll go ahead and exec C, Windows Explorer, and Carol Next Love, which is what would be passed in as the second argument. So interesting, it seems like we define a variable and then it gets saved as a file name with the contents given from this document. And then we 
try to stage it to be able to open an Internet Explorer, or excuse me, the, the Windows File Explorer, right? So let's explore this. Let's go see how we might be able to determine hey, we've got this document text that we were able to track down, but now we need to find the built-in document properties. Well, these are things that you'll actually be able to retrieve within Microsoft Word. If you go check out the File tab and you select Info, it shows you some of the properties. Might be a little bit interesting here. Uh, you see some size, page length, words included. Words is a little bit interesting because that's not what we saw from just the front of it. Um, and then tags is ath dot <laughs> uh, weird. Author is this last modified by that. So there's more that we might be able to explore here though. If we click on that show all properties button down on the very bottom right, uh, show all properties will expand this. And uh, I'm curious though, it doesn't give me more. I was hoping for the keywords value. We can see categories is included here as wscript.shell, which makes sense for it trying to create an object from wscript.shell and then try to execute some function. Now, if I click on the properties button here, you can move into the advanced properties and this brings it up here for us. Now we can see the title, subject, author, etc. But keywords is included that looks to be the very same as that tags value down there. Peculiar thing, this is reversed, remember? If we take a look at this, this is the value that we end up seeing reversed inside of our document. Going back to our macro code here in VBA, we get this value and then we reverse it. So let's go find out what that YouTube POW value should actually be. I'm gonna pivot in and out of Remnux here. A Remnux I'll be using for a little bit more analysis that is not within the uh, actual Windows 11 virtual machine with Microsoft Office. So what I'll do is I'll just create a, I don't know, play.py file, and that's just fine here. Now I've pasted this in, and you know what? Uh, we don't really need to do this with a Python script. You could do this in like bash or literally anything, pipe it to rev, but if we were just go ahead and print this out as a string, and then let's reverse it. We'll go ahead and use the square braces to go ahead and slice, but we'll use uh, no beginning or end of it, and we'll set the iterator or the step to be negative one. That will go ahead and reverse that string for me here. Now, if I move that into my terminal, I can go ahead and run that, and you can see, ooh, there's our value like pow like dot hta hta being a hypertext application or one of those ooh microsoft windows uh willingly going to execute some code that it will just run uh with an any user clicking on the link or opening it through the windows file explorer so this will be the true file name that this thing saves as. Uh, we should go ahead and actually maybe create our own like pow like .hta file. And then we'll go ahead and see what the contents might actually be. Remember YouTube pow, that variable is now set to like pow like .hta. But the actual contents that we end up saving as are all the contents of our active document. But don't forget, from our previous contents function that ran, what we do is we take the active document content and then we replace all of those x8 values that might be potentially there with an empty string. It just, it just removes them all, it just deletes them. So why don't we go see what in our active documents might actually be included here? You might remember, well, it's pretty dull, it's pretty boring. There's, there's really nothing here other than this phishing lure. Oh, sorry, I don't know why my screen might glitch out when trying to full screen, um, but Note, if I were to try and select everything or hit control A on my keyboard to select, hey, there's more than just the image here. You could probably see it pretty well. Uh, maybe this is just text that happens to be white. If I change this color to red, yeah, there's a lot of noise and nonsense here, or even black, whatever we end up doing here. This is the value that we would want to copy and paste. So let me go bring that into our other Remnux virtual machine. And will it let me here? Oh, I'm not sure. Here we go, slap it in just like this. And note, this has all of those X8 values. 
a little bit of a mess here, but uh, we can clean this up, right? We can just use that find and replace functionality and find all of the X8 values and replace them with nothing. I'm gonna hit Control Alt Enter on my keyboard to go ahead and find and replace everything within Sublime Text. And now we have a little bit more readable HTA style syntax. Noted it is starting with an HTML file and uh, a whole lot of nonsense that we can dive into. So let's save this. We'll call this, uh, I suppose, original, uh, or we can just leave it as the current file name and then let's start to modify it because I would like to make this a little bit easier to read. So what I'm gonna end up doing is just firing up a web browser and probably going to like, oh, some cheesy HTML beautify online. Here's one HTML viewer, beautify HTML. Give me that, thank you. Looking good. Let me go ahead and set that syntax to HTML within our Sublime Text Editor here. And now we have a little bit more thing to read. Check it out. You'll notice that we start with HTML as the normal HTA syntax and structure. We define some elements as like regular paragraphs, but they all have unique ID values and the same sort of variable naming as our macro. Door like girl. Dow girl Dow, <laughs> next love love, uh, and some weird stuff. Okay, uh, so next love love just looks to be the alphabet. I'm assuming Dow girl Dow is just base 64. Uh, oh, but there's some weird stuff in there. You can see there's hyphens there. Uh, and then we have other JavaScript functions that are defined here. So like tube door is going to be a new ActiveX object of the argument. So that's worthwhile to note. How often do we run this? What? We don't. That, that is not executed. At least in here, at least on that stage, that's kind of weird. Load down next. Oh, load down next is going to end up getting an element by an ID value. And oh, and getting the actual text of it. So when in later functions we use that function load down next to get an ID, that's our next love love. Here's our alphabet. Right? So that's pulling that with door pound next as our variable. We have like, like, like set to an empty string. Other functions here, Carol, Carol, like returning a cha, CHA, that's kind of odd. I don't know why it just prepends that there. Um, do we ever run this function? Nope, not in this stage. Okay, so let's see what we might be able to dive into within this function. Uh, we have some other variables that are defined and then it looks like it uses some regular expressions to be able to replace content as needed and then do some oddball math. Okay. I don't exactly want to bother trying to reverse engineer this and you know see what happens where and when, but truthfully, we probably don't have to. Uh, we might be able to finagle this and just let it go ahead and, I don't know, display this out rather than a go ahead and eval, because one of these functions, as you can see up here, door light girl is simply eval. So where do we call door light girl? Oh, we use it down here in the function door pow carol. Load down next is what's going to be retrieving that value. So it gets the eval string. And then like door carol is the current window moving to weird locations, but using window indexed at the variable and the value eval will allow it to execute something. And the next load U is going to be the argument that's passed in. So door pow carol, <laughs> this sounds so stupid, I'm sorry. We'll end up calling it with door tube load. Okay, so Door tube load is love girl Dow you download. What is this video? <laughs> um, love girl Dow is doing some of the presumably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is going to be the function that modifies it, and then load like Dow does some splits and reverses. Okay. So can we clean this to just be its own JavaScript script? Like just regularly run stuff. So let's say um, cleaned JavaScript, maybe, dot JS. So we know that our alphabet over here 
And let me turn word wrap on so we can see that a little bit better. Where did we put our value of next love love? We put that here. So that can be changed to just be the alphabet or the printable character set, right? Let's grab all of those and put them where door pound next was, I believe, right? And then we need, oh God. Next love love is good. What else do we do with door like girl? Remember that's eval. Okay, so we can just replace that there. And honestly, because that just returns it, we can just put the string eval, right? So that can go away. And now we have Dow girl Dow as this weird random data. Uh, let's just set that as a string. I'm getting some weird horrific syntax highlighting because of all of our HTML crap. So let's try and nerf these. And that was called, oh goodness, what now? Dow girl Dow? Yeah. So var <laughs> Dow girl Dow can equal all of that. Looking good? So we don't need to do load down next anymore because now we have those variables present, pulling them in. And that's all that we end up pulling here for the rest of this code. Okay, so Dow girl Dow will be split. And then we end up taking some door tube load. I'm sorry, I don't know if this is making sense to you, um, but it is to me because we are just rearranging these variable names despite being whatever they are. Um, we're just kind of cutting it up so that we can grab what we need. Um, now, the other things that are ran here, like these functions that are defined up here, we don't need to use eval to actually detonate this thing. And you know what, let's, let's try and remove some of these scripts. What does like door Carol do? Oh, that's the one that is the window. So we don't need to close the window in this case, but it would have tried to close the window, right? Had this been a natural um, W script or HTA file that goes ahead and detonates. And then we will call this and then call this. Um, door that is going to run eval in its current state. And let's remove these script tags because they aren't exactly necessary. Um, that, oh shoot, is this Visual Basic script? Yeah, so not, not JavaScript. I, I rose the wrong thing. <laughs> but wait, that's weird. The rest of it was JavaScript. It just like switches in and out of those different languages. I don't know if I like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we can clean the rest of this and some of these will have a little bit more indentation to them. Oh God, I ruined everything. Yeah, whatever, I'm fine with that. This is all because it needs to be indented. Sure. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I believe it. I trust it. I think we have everything cut up. We just need to make sure that we don't actually detonate this by using eval. Uh, we want to actually just go ahead and use something like console.log or wscript.echo. The thing is, we don't even need to use this. We can just use wscript.echo. Can we not? Let's, let's try a wscript.echo because I do want to be able to run this on the Windows machine uh, and let it unravel things. So now call is what would be ran in Visual Basic Script, but let's just start with trying to run it, run the function that will let this all unravel um, and yeah. That's it. It's gonna echo its own within this function. So maybe we can trust it. Should we try it? Let's go experiment, let's go play. I'm gonna go over to my Windows 10 box um, and let's create a new notepad file. We'll just call it like test.js, perfect. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and I wanna open that. I don't have the terminal. I don't have like Windows terminal because I'm on Windows 10, but let's move into the desktop. Let's go ahead and run notepad on test.js, fire that thing up, 
and let's paste in all of this crappy code here. And now fingers crossed, let's run test.js. Oh, something broke. Window is undefined. Yeah, man, because you're not in a stupid, where did, where did you even get window from? Is window in here? Oh yeah, it is, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess we don't really need that. Those are the only things that it would try to run with. But yeah, we don't need to do that in this case. So let's nerf those out. Um, and then just make sure we echo these. How about that? Let's try this syntax. Fire that up. Ooh, I want to be able to use C script to run this so I can actually display it on the command line. So C script, hello? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, clear the screen. C script, please test.js. And this is the next dump that it tries to run here. So that would be, I guess, stage one. How about that? Well, I don't know, stage one dot JS, still gonna be JavaScript. And I didn't end up printing out the next one, which truthfully we should do on load load girl. And that, I guess it can just spit it all out. We don't need to split those up. So this way we paste that syntax in. And now when we clean this, run it, we should have all of the data there. Now I don't know because I do see some URLs that this thing looks like a downlink from. Um, and I'm not quite sure if this is going to have data that will actually respond for us. Let's go ahead and paste this in. Uh, can you beautify this please? No, because it's not really HTML. What if I did like script? Would you be able to clean that? And script. Can you clean that? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, cool. So what we do from here is we create a new ActiveX object where we would be able to go ahead and download things. So let's rename that variable and that, let's not make this as confusing as the last one was. Um, so XML HTTP object is really what we wanna call that. And then we open to Copeland benefit G, yada, 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 random variables that would probably be keyed to this specific target. And then we send that request. And if we actually get a successful response in the HTTP status, then we load, uh, love load like with an ADODB stream where we could go ahead and write all the response contents and put it into C users public load like load dot JPEG. Mm. And then we will detonate it with reg server 32. So that is likely a DLL file because that's how you would invoke DLL files, dynamic link libraries um, with a actual JPEG file here. I'm not quite sure if this link, oh, yeah, JPEG file that is not a JPEG file. It is a DLL file. I'm not quite sure if this is actually going to still exist because it it has been some time since this was sent to me and I doubt this domain is still alive. But if it isn't, hey, you know, we had a lot of fun at least drilling down to this point and I think I'm okay with that as a video. So forgive me. Let me try and curl this thing. Not found. Yeah, you can see it here. Uh, that server is still up though, however. <laughs> the uh, copolandbenefitg.com is still a thing. Well, I don't know how much further we'll be able to do with that kind of taken offline. Uh, it would be worthwhile doing some, maybe Googling around and learning, hey, you know, what is this thing if it exists? Ooh, this domain has been suspended due to a non-completion of an ICANN mandated contact verification. Fascinating. Okay. Um, was this ever on any like IOCs? Indicators of compromise. IOC's domains. Ooh, 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 ooh. HP Threat Research. Looks like it has one from TA551. HP Threat Research. Ooh, super slick. HP Security that was doing a lot of their stuff. What is TA551? I'm assuming we're going to find out that that is Iced ID. Gold Cabin. 
anyway, they do have this in here, right? If I search for, yeah, Copa login, and this was way back around that same time frame uh, when this email was sent, 2021, uh, December 10th. So about a year ago while I'm recording this. MITRE ATT&CK is tracking this financially motivated threat group that's been active since 2018, email-based malware distribution campaigns. If folks aren't familiar, by the way, uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework is an incredible resource um, that kind of just lays the groundwork and sets a standard for how folks can talk about malicious activity or attack techniques, tradecraft, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, you'll notice that all of these are kind of broken down into techniques and then eventually sub-techniques uh, and still mapping specific groups or threat actors or adversaries. Um, it's interesting to see what they might kind of trigger here, noting that, hey, we do have obfuscated variable names and JavaScript configuration files. Uh, what did they say? They mask DLLs as DAT files and JPEG files. We would have seen that had this continued. Use MSHTA to execute payloads, reg server 32 to load malicious DLLs, et cetera, et cetera. Prompted users to enable macros within spear phishing attachments to install malware wild. I didn't see any indicator of iced ID um, or ice did or however people say that. I, I don't know if that's... Oh, here it is. Here's one from Red Canary. Red Canary doing incredible stuff as always. TA551, also known as the same group that we were tracking, uh, uses large-scale phishing campaigns to deliver additional malware payloads. Ice ID and Valak are the predominant payloads we'd observed with phishing campaigns in 2020. Oh, so this is actually pretty old... Chatting about it in 2020, and this is probably the exact same attack chain. Email with password protected zip archive. Remember that uh, password protection is to trigger and, and or keep it safe so that antivirus won't immediately flag it. Um, if there's any opportunity for it to kind of squeeze under the radar, uh, at least archiving the zip file with a password mm, doesn't let the antivirus software kind of peer into it. User opens document, enables macros, two thirds of detection stop here. Yep. Okay, so those are options that you might be able to block or stop the kill chain here. Network connection to download next stage DLL installer, and that would be what we would have continued on down the road for. DLL installer to execute following payload, excuse me, follow on payload with Reg Server 32. A second stage payload would be Ursniff, Z Loader, Valak, I said, your Quackbot or Qbot there. So I guess we didn't dig into the real fun stuff here, truthfully, uh, but we did get into the stager and maybe that was kind of neat. So you can see some of those, again, living off the land techniques, the tricks that it might use. Trend Micro is tacking this just as well. Unit 42, Usans even just as well. Lots of great folks keeping an eye on this one. It was hot. But that is how we might follow through with it and uh, you might be able to do the very, very same. So hey, with that said, thanks so much for watching everybody. I hope this was a little bit of a fun one. Hey, just unraveling some more pieces, playing with payloads and seeing what we might be able to de-obfuscate and get into, or just tracking, you know, what variables go where here and there. Um, and maybe you'll learn a little bit or two with that. Uh, if you haven't, you know what? You are gonna learn a heck of a lot of stuff with the sponsor of today's video, Zero to Auto, and their training course that digs into some of that super sweet low level disassembly, running stuff up with a debugger, when it's a compiled application like an EX portable executable or a DLL dynamic link library. So had we grabbed that iced ID actual payload, you would be able to cut that up with the same skills and stuff that you learn within that sponsor. So, Hey, please, please, please go check them out see what they can do for you and learn some great stuff. Uh, kudos and all the credit and love to zero to auto and offset turning solutions. So with that, I'm done rambling. This has been a little bit of a long video and it didn't need to be, but uh, if you did enjoy this video, please do those like comment algorithm, subscribe stuff, you know, the same thing that I say at the end of every single video, but uh, I super appreciate all your support and uh, it's six in the morning, so I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> Bye everyone, see you soon.